Greetings, this is Charles Darwin, and I'm speaking to you from one of the most famous fossil locations in the world, and where you can come and dig fossils for yourself and take them home for $10 a day. This is Fossil Bowl, which is mostly a racetrack, so if you hear some racing going on in the background, that's because that's the main activity that occurs here. Just a few feet away from one of the racetracks, however, is an outcrop where you can dig some of the most famous fossils that you will ever have a chance to dig for yourself. Now, when I first came here, I didn't find my way around. The signage isn't very well, so I ended up actually on the racetrack, and I didn't know it with my little car, and I almost spilled out. Uh, but I did manage to get out and park in the right place eventually. That was a lot of fun. Well, now let me tell you about the fossils. It's on State Highway 3, just south of the town of Clarkia, Idaho, which is south of Coeur d'Alene. You can get to it not very far from Interstate 90. Now, today, the species that you find around here are conifers that are characteristic of the Pacific Northwest, spruces, firs, and things like that, and some grasslands. Relatively dry and cool environment. However, 15 million years ago, when this was a shallow lake, it was surrounded by trees that are more characteristic of China today, or of the eastern United States, rather than of the Pacific Northwest. And certainly, it's characteristic of a wetter environment. Now, what happened in the subsequent 15 million years after these fossils formed is mountains arose, <clears throat> thus creating a rain shadow. And so, the species that are here are characteristic of a very moist forest 15 million years ago. And there's a large number of leaf impressions that are here, and you can then use a, a blunt instrument of some kind, butter knife or something like that, to wedge in between the layers, and then gradually pull them out, and then gradually break them apart. It's difficult to find entire leaf fossils from there, and occasionally fish as well. That's difficult to find because frequently you'll break them in two. And so what you might want to do is bring the whole rock with you, and then later, when you're working in a laboratory, you can then separate them. So you can gradually work them out. And this is one that I pulled out. And there's a fossil of a leaf right there. It appears to be a uh, birch, but I'm not sure. Uh, I had a good birch leaf fossil. I dropped it on the rubble pile, and I can't find it now. But this one, anyway, I'm not going to try to do any more work on it. I'm just going to take the whole thing with me. And I doubt that you can actually see the birch fossil on there. I will uh, present more information on all of the species that can be found here, etc., on my blog, which is Honest Ab, that is honest-ab.blogspot.com. And so you can get more information there. So I'll just kind of give you a brief introduction at this point. Some of the species that were found at the time and the family that owns the place where you can uh, pay your 10 bucks, uh, which is a real deal for being able to do this sort of thing, are characteristic of the Pacific Northwest or of China, and some species that actually became quite rare. One of them is Metasequoia, which is the Don Redwood, which was thought to be extinct until some were found in China. Their fossils, however, are here. Bald Cypress, which is now characteristic of the southeastern United States. And let's see, various kinds of firs and pines but not the same species that grow here today. Let's see what else. Birch, two species of birch, hop hornbeam, and tan oak, which is now characteristic of the Pacific Slope of California. Chestnut, which you will find in China, but also used to find in the Eastern United States before they all died from a fungus disease. Tupelo, oak, but not any of the same species of oak that can be found today. Holly, and katsura tree, which is similar to redbud, and the Katsura tree is still found, as the name might suggest, in Japan. Poplars and Carolina moonseed. Silver bells, which are characteristic of the Appalachians. And Gladitsia, which is the honey locust. And let's see, what else? Magnolia and avocado. These are all things that were growing here 15 million years ago or not found here today, but you can find their fossils in great abundance here at Fossil Bowl. Now, when you dig the fossil out, you have to preserve it, you have to wrap it in wet newspaper, and then after about three months, let it very slowly dry out, perhaps in a refrigerator, and then you'll be able to preserve the fossils. Otherwise, they'll just turn black and crackle up and be gone. Anyway, 
Let's think about what this fossil deposit means in terms of evolution. It gives us a snapshot in time to see what plant life was like 15 million years ago. It was very similar, but not quite the same as what you find today. Some of the same genera that are found today in China and the eastern United States, but not here, but not necessarily the same species. So you can see that a small amount of evolution has occurred during that time. There was even a paper where some specimens were preserved so well that they were able to analyze the DNA of these specimens and to be able to show just how much, or in this case, how little evolution has occurred during that time. Now also thinking about it in the terms of evolution education, there are many people who prefer a creationist explanation, but let's see why that wouldn't work. First of all, if this had formed during a flood, which is what most creationists would say, how would it be that a flood just happened to randomly wash together the leaves of plants that are today found in China and Eastern North America, rather than a random assortment of leaves? Of course, they could always invoke a miracle and say that God scooshed the leaves around to make sure that the right ones got here so that we would today think that evolution had occurred or think that the earth is old. Well, there are some who would say, no, this is actually a post-flood deposit that this was formed in place, so you wouldn't expect a random assortment of leaves. And that sounds like it would be a more logical explanation. The problem is, how do you form something like this after the flood? That would take miracles. And also, you would need to have no rain shadow at the time these plants grew here. So you would have to say, oh, well, uh, the uh, cascades hadn't arisen yet after the flood, then God rose them up later. Well, you see, if you invoke enough miracles, you can explain anything. You could say, for example, that God made these fossils in place just to trick us or something like that. You could say anything if you invoke enough miracles. But if you think of this as being a natural process that produced these, there's really only one conclusion that you could draw, and that's about an old earth and gradual evolution that has occurred in the last 15 million years. So this is a wonderful place to visit south of Clarkia, Idaho, Fossil Bowl, look for the racetrack, and then look for the family that owns it, and they will be glad to take you to and show you where the fossils are that you can dig and take some home with you. And it's, it's quite an experience. You read about these things in books, but you don't hear about them from firsthand experience unless you come and do it yourself. This is Charles Darwin. I'm going to get back to digging for the rest of the day. Tally ho, and amen.